Hi, everybody. Cliff Kelly and Scout, as always, greeting you from Colorado Springs on what's today? What's today? Uh, the second day of September 2020. It's good to be with you again. And, uh, hmm. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I'm saying this more and more often. It's been an interesting 24 hours, so maybe that's a sideways, upside down uh, encouragement that what we're going to talk about today is important. Um, I may or may not mention a couple of the details about that uh, as we go in, but uh, uh, this will be the first installment of two, I think, instead of three, uh, titled Notes on a New Song for the Last Days, Divine Provision for the Remnant of God. Um, I think it was probably just three, four, five mornings ago or so that not once, not twice, but three times in a row, by whatever means, you know, the Lord chooses to prod me and, and, and prompt me. Uh, a new song, a new song, a new song. And I, uh, typically the great obedient man of God that I am, kept thinking and, or saying out loud, no, that, no, sorry, Lord, that can't be you. That can't be right. A new song in the midst of that? So uh, <laughs> he won the day, as he does. Um, and I started diving into this study and, the more I did, I, you know, it, it, what sounds or feels or seems like a logical contradiction at first hearing or reading of it in, in God, in Christ, ends up making a whole lot of sense. So uh, he cannot contradict himself. There's no contradiction in, in his text. So uh, indeed, it, it begins to make sense to me. And I want to share with you what, what I'm discovering along the way. Let's open in a quick prayer and we'll get on with it. Uh, Father, we thank you and praise you that you're a lot smarter than we are. <laughs> uh, and uh, maybe I need to say it in those, that sort of vernacular to remind us of just who it is that you are. And we only, we only appreciate a, a slice, a tiny sliver of what you really are capable of who you really are and how indeed wise uh, you are. So we thank you and praise you for continuing to prompt us and kick us in the rump every now and then to get us down the right road or the right branch of the road. We thank you and praise you now for what you're going to do today. Keep me from error. A uh, uh, little bit of uh, physical weakness today. Nothing, nothing major, nothing major. So a little extra grace and strength would be great, according to 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Bless us, Lord. To bless you back in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, so uh, here's the scripture, one of three I got, and if, if I had my journal open to me, I could show you three different passages that, using the same phrase, a new song that I got within probably a 50-hour period. So I figured, hmm, yeah, I guess I should probably teach on this. Uh, here's the scripture from Psalm 96, one through three. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth, exclamation point. Sing to the Lord, bless, affectionately praise his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples. Uh, very uplifting, but if we're going to be honest with each other, uh, very challenging in this hour. I get precious notes from... Uh, a number of you about how, what a struggle it's been, how tired we are. Uh, and then God dares to come along and lay this on our desk. So uh, let's see what he's got. Uh, a couple of quotes, two or three quotes. First one is from, I don't know these authors, so uh, I just found the quotes as I looked up the subject matter and then did a little vetting of their background to make sure that <laughs> they're not warlocks or something. Um and let me bring them to you here. The first one is from somebody named Danny L. Diobe or Daub, uh, D-E-A-U-B-E, con acento sobre la E. So I'm not sure about the pronunciation. It says this, Danny says uh, this, There are some things we learn on stormy seas that we can never learn on calm, smooth water. Can I get a massive amen on that, a phrase and a question I never pose? Boy, let me say that again. There are some things we learn on stormy seas that we never learn on calm, smooth waters. Ah. The God of the storm has something to teach us, and his love always drives his actions. 
And when we come to a place of trusting, trusting him in the hard place, which it took me decades to get to, and I'm still working on it. Uh, there, there comes a settledness, a peace, um, a fearlessness. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Second is from Haruki Marakami uh, from a work called Kafka on the Shore, published in 2005. Uh, that first work by uh, Danny Daub was from a work, I Will Praise You in the Storm, um, published in 2013. Um, here's another one now from Haruki Marakami. And once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through necessarily, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked into the storm. That's what the storm is all about. I love that because it's true. It's biblically, theologically, practically, experientially, absolutely true. And finally, this one kind of a lament, a prayer. And this is this last quote probably would be on the lips of many of us in the last three years or so. It's from Tracy Peterson in a work called A Lady of High Regard, published in 2007. Listen to this. I want to believe in a new thing, Lord. I want that more than anything. I want to forget the old things, the bad and ugly things that have sent me here. Please, please let me see your hand in all of this. Let me see the path through this wilderness. I know we've all prayed that in so many words, too many times to count, especially in these last few years. And I, I end with that because that's kind of where all of us are more or less at the end of the day these days. I, 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 I mumble to the Lord out loud like a, like a good Jew. Uh, almost all the time. And one of the things that pops out of me, what is this, God? And I'm the guy who's supposed to be somewhat expert at telling you what it is. But out of my bones and marrow and soul comes this cry every now and then, God, what is this? What is all this? It, it, it's, it's beyond me, even though we study the scriptures and we do know a good deal about what's going on. It still feels like it's so strange and so formidable and so massive and so big and so beyond us. And God understands that kind of pleading. And that's why I ended with that particular quote. First thoughts of all the things I have sensed that we are to do in the midst of all of that is sing a new song. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Uh, can anybody say kvetch, which is the Yiddish term for griping and moaning and complaining? And I do a lot of that. Is this idea of learning to sing a new song? And it, there's only one who can teach us how to do that. Hashem and his son Yeshua ben David. They, they will, and the Holy Spirit, they will have to teach us. He will have to teach us how it is we do this. It's not in us to do it. Uh, so this is not going to be a frothy, flimsy, little false fairy tale kind of teaching. I wouldn't know how to do that anymore if my life depended on it. Uh, but it is hopeful. It's a, it's a solid teaching of promise uh, that is uplifting because it's real. Um, and so I hope it does exactly that for all of us, myself included. So my story without all the gory details... You've heard me say in so many words, despite all the chaos and confusion and loss I have personally experienced in the last three years and more, I have never experienced, on the other hand, by staggering contrast, stunning contrast, more joy, more peace, more settledness in my soul about who I am, final acceptance of who and what I am, warts and all. Took practically a lifetime to get there. And that phrase, comfortable in your own skin. I'm finally there after a lifetime of battling that. And the, and, the, and the irony is it's in the midst of all that. How does that work? Try to figure some of that out today. So what is all this strange experience of seeming contradic contradiction of circumstance and internal 
internal subtleness all about, or where we're, where we're heading for in terms of that internal subtleness. We're at different places along that road. Uh, so a few things come to mind, and uh, let me bring them to you. Um, th this is just for me now, not from sourcing. I do a lot of sourcing. This is just this old man's experience of these last five years, and this is what came to mind. First of all, tested by fire. Seems to be something about moving through God's tests, intense ones lately, and coming out on the other side still intact and, and actually even better in some ways. That's awesome. I think it's like any other test. I remember taking an exam and, you know, you study and you study and you prep and you prep and you're anxious and nervous and sweat popping out and headaches coming and sleeplessness. And finally, you take the test, you do pretty good and you feel good about it on the other side. That's not, un, uh, in, that's not unusual, nor is it very different for what I'm talking about here. Everybody loves to come through the test on the other side. Nobody likes going through it. But on the other side, there's this sense of muscularity, this sense of accomplishment, the sense of, hey, I did that. With God's help, I did that. And it's a good feeling. Second, discipline is love. Every time something goes wrong, uh, it tells you a lot about me. But I think it's probably a good default. I don't go to somebody else and say, oh, that that's why. Sometimes I do because I have this colitis. They go to the, the diet. Well, I must have eaten something badly last night. By the way, last night we had fajitas. <laughs> could be having something to do with with my condition today. But when when something goes wrong, I immediately go to, oh, God, what have I done now? W what is it, Lord? Where did I fail you? You know, that, I guess psychologists would say that's self-defeating. On the other hand, humility would argue that that's a better place than going than to, hey, it's her fault. Hey, uh, it's their fault. Hey, it's because of this or because of that. That might come later on reflection of a multivariable kind of, you know, uh, causation of your current struggle. But best thing to go to the Lord right now is say, Lord, have I offended you? I don't think that's a bad habit. Uh, it can be taken to excess. I don't think that's a bad way to go. Because once that's cleared up, then we can look at, you know, all the other stuff. I'm reminded of Toy Story a million years ago, uh, the Jewish dinosaur, I have guilt. <laughs> I, I think the Jews invented guilt. Uh, I know I think I do sometimes. So another idea that came back to me here is less threatening this time was a sense that when God is tough on me or circumstance, he allows circumstances to be tough on me, it may not always be because I'm no longer in his favor. In fact, one scripture says, uh, for the Lord corrects and disciplines everyone whom he loves, and he punishes, even scourges. That's a very strong word. Every son whom he accepts and welcomes to his heart and cherishes. And there was a passage I skipped over. I want to get it into the record from Psalm 66, 12, about the first point tested by fire. Listen to this. You cause men, you God caused men to ride over our heads when we were prostrate. We went through fire and through water, but you brought us out into a broad, moist place to the abundance and refreshment of the open air. You move through it, the fire and the flood, and he gets you through it. He will. He will not fail. And you get to that better place. Anyway, and he does discipline those whom he loves. Third, finding the zone. Uh, if there's any particular thing to explain why uh, I'm feeling, experiencing, uh, I don't know, more, more settledness in my soul, despite all the stuff that's trying to whack me down all the time. It's that sense of finding the zone. I'm 75. I don't think I found out what I was really supposed to do with my life until I was about 70. Um, I... That may be my slowness of learning and stubbornness, but I guess the most central source of my new sense of well-being now is that I have never been more convinced that I am finally doing exactly what I was designed by God to do. <laughs> Pay ain't great, but the work is awesome. Um, I love doing this for you guys, for the Lord and you. I love this. I literally can't wait to get up in the morning and go at it again, spend my... Seven, eight, nine, ten hours 
hammering this stuff out. Um, never had that experience before. Uh, and it's a, from a familiar uh, scripture uh, proof, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, life scripture for many of us. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord's thoughts and plans for welfare and peace, not for evil, although it seems like that when we're coming through all the stuff to give you hope in your final outcome. Man, that's where I am. I don't know how long it lasts, but I love it while it does. Finally, moving in boldness. I have always been afraid. When I was a little kid, maybe because I was skinny and a half Mexican kid and took some stuff from the big kids and bullies. And, uh, I think I had five fights as a kid. I think I won one of them. Uh, I walked in a lot of fear before Christ was in my life. A lot of it. Um, not proud of that. But I, whatever courage I have now was never for me. Um, and so this boldness, there are a number of scriptures that I could use to describe what I'm going to tell you about. But based on my experience of God these past three and a half years, there's only one key, one key to God's boldness that is now in me that can come in no other way but this. Listen to the scriptures from Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame and con I've quoted this before. And they overcame and conquered him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony for they did not love their life and renounce their faith even when faced with death. After God stripped me and my family of just about everything, material, everything gone. <laughs> Something happened in the aftermath inside of me once I was set free from <laughs> kicking and screaming from all those institutional demands and you know, you gotta do this, you can't say this. Oh my, my, you better watch out. You better not cry. <laughs> a freedom began to come in me. And if you sense or hear that in what I say and what I write, God did this, nobody else. Against my flesh, against my preferences, against my advice. Please, Lord, no, not that. And so I want to make sure to boast on the one who did this so that you don't look at me and say, oh, boy, he, you know, he'll 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 speak this to so and so. Uh, -uh I didn't do this. I do remember as a very new Christian, probably only one year old, I stumbled across Jeremiah one and Jeremiah 15, the two passages of which basically say this I had no idea it would be a call on me later in life, 40 years down the road. You know, you tell them what I tell you to say. And if you don't, I'll, I'll uh, embarrass you in front of them all. You keep telling them what I tell you to say. And they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. I will be with you. Uh, took 40 years, basically, to get me from there to here. And now, I don't mean to boast on me. Something again just happened last night where I had to take on a major, major figure who I think, a dear, dear friend who I think was uh, way off base. Uh, she's going to call me later today and we're going to try to iron things out. I never would have done that three years, five years ago. Never. I was always in fear, ab abject fear of authority. The rich, the powerful, the famous. Not anymore. To be clear, again, this is a mighty work of God. King Solomon perhaps said it best. The fear of man brings a snare, doesn't it? But whoever leans on, trusts in, and puts his confidence in the Lord is safe and set on high. That's from Proverbs 29, 25. A couple of key terms, a snare from the Hebrew mokesh, a bait or a lure, a snare or a trap to draw you in and weaken you and neutralize you, compromise you. A noose or hook for catching a prey designed to entice one toward sin, toward compromise. To catch with a snare, to entangle, to bring into unexpected evil, perplexity, or dangerous. I personally believe, by the way, this is the primary sin of the church. Fear of man. Fear of consequences. Fear, 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 fear. So they can't preach what they really want to preach. 
I would hesitate in fairness. I, I would not hesitate in fairness to say most pastors know what they should be teaching. They know what they should be saying, but they're afraid. They're afraid. And you cannot serve God when you are afraid of man. Can't be done. Sell cars instead. Second term, set on high. Oppositely, for the one who shall fear God and not man, nor beast, nor death itself. This is his or her reward, which is honor and exaltation. If you will do and say and speak and preach and teach and write what God says you to do, even though they will oppose you, they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you after taking a few dozen hits. It's taken from the Hebrew Sagab. To be inaccessibly, God will make you inaccessibly high beyond the reach of your enemy. I, I'm experiencing it right now. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Somebody who eviscerated my family in the church, in the house of God, four years ago, is no longer above me as my enemy, but he is far beneath me now. And I don't wish him to stay there, but this is a true promise. I'm seeing it happen. To be set securely above the fray, unassailable, to make us fearless and unassailable, as in cannot be bribed nor silenced nor compromised. When God brings us through that fire and flood and gets us to a place where, you know, I, one of the phrases that pops out of me, what, <laughs> they can do nothing more to me, Lord, than kill me. That I got nothing left they can take. That's where I am. Boast on God, not me. To be excellent, to be strong, to be confident and bold, and it only comes through fire and flood. You don't get there any other way. That's to encourage you that your struggle is not without purpose. Divine, loving, awesome, deeply satisfying purpose. A little bit further down the road. The point, so if you find yourself in a sustained and exhausting pattern of trial and testing, which is so often the case today, of your very soul and faith and life. Don't faint. Don't quit. I think I said it last time. In, in moments like that, when I just, I literally verbalize out loud to God, I can't do this anymore, Lord. I, I don't think I can do this anymore. Two firm, non-ooey-gooey words from the Godhead. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Perseverance is a big deal to the boss. It's a big deal. The rewards of which are indescribable. There's a phrase I've used before in prior teachings that I got from Mr. Zimmerman, Assembly of God's Superintendent five-minute ministry all my life, all our lives, preparing us for this last day's mission, if, if you will. And I'm reminded of Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you, it, Jeremiah was called as a young man, child. <laughs> you know, squeak that, I, I'm not, I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, whether it's Moses or Jeremiah or, you know, Gideon or... <laughs> Yeah, to you, God, I've, I've actually caught myself saying to the Lord, have you lost your mind, sir? And then I pull back and I apologize and I bow. Do you know who you're dealing with down here, Father? Oh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess you do. Created me. In fact, you didn't only create me. Listen to Jeremiah 1, 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew and approved of you. As my, here's that word I'm going to end up on today, as my chosen instrument, beloved. And before you were born, I separated you and set you apart. Before you were even in your mother's womb, I had this all planned. Depending on whether or not you'd say yes. Consecrating you and I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Now, iced tea, sweet tea for you Southern folks. 
you say to yourself, I, I'm not a prophet. I will, you'll never hear me call myself a prophet. But here's the reason why. The word for prophet in this passage is from the Hebrew Nabi. And it literally is defined this way. One who is inspired of God to speak God's truth. Anybody who does that is a prophetic voice. And the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of Christ Jesus. Whoever tells the truth, especially these days, is a prophet. Small p, not holding the office of a prophet, but speaking a prophetic word. Truth is a big deal today. Bigger than my long experience on this planet. So we've become God's oracle to a dying nation and an imperiled people and a neutered church as we are led to unflinchingly and lovingly, unfailingly declare God to those about to perish. That's the role and function of a prophet, a prophetic voice, just telling the truth. And it's hard. Being quiet is a lot easier. Just ask 83% of the American church. Next section, something old, something new, watching the time. The next logical phase of my study then is to turn toward a well-worn passage that literally teaches itself. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, love this, and this is what the heartbeat of this teaching is. Behold. God says, I am doing something new. And when God says that, it can only be stupendously wonderful, though at times painful. Wonderful. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness for you, rivers in the desert. And that's where we are. Wilderness, desert, that's where we are. So a couple of terms, former things from the Hebrew Rishon, former, first, chief, ancient, ancestral, traditional, tradition, former things in prophetic terms as reference to God's judgment upon them. Things that were formerly foretold, things that were before, the old ways. Turn now to a new thing from the term Chadash, attributed in several scriptures to, listen to this, a new king who, known, who knew not Joseph. From Exodus 1 8, a fresh new experience or event of some kind, lately made or deployed, invented, produced, or come into being that has existed a short time only that never used to be the way it was before. Recent in origin, novel, new, opposed to the old, and used of things lately introduced to our knowledge. Just recently, not before known, recently discovered, not familiar, unaccustomed, as in, here's that word again, unprecedented. That's where we are. That's where we are. And I think what God's trying to get us to understand and accept, that's more a good thing than a bad thing. Believe me. Also a new way or a way taken from the Hebrew, Derek, a new way he's giving us, showing us, teaching us a new road, distance, journey, manner, path, direction, strategy, experience, condition, enablement, course of life, action, undertaking of moral action, character or duty. He's forming, he's forging. It's that tempered steel. He's forging new character in us, beloved. And it can come in no other way. You already know this, except by the cauldron, as with tempered steel. He's making of us a new sword, a sword of truth to a dying world. A passage, the place, a place of passage, of passing. Hence, a road of any kind, a highway, a method, a new way of doing things is what he's all about. Finally, in the wilderness, the final idea is from the term midbar, desert, wilderness, uninhabited or dry, forbidding land. That's what it feels like all around us. Many times have I mumbled to the Lord, I don't belong here, Lord. I don't like it down here anymore. And I used to. I don't like it down here so much anymore. I know a number of you have written me about that. You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? It's a normal response. This is not our home. This isn't it. It's pretty as Colorado is, and it's stunningly beautiful. It's not my home. 
It's not my home. It becomes clearer to me almost by the day. To finish the definition of wilderness, the habitat of jackals and wild beasts implies speech that is dry, subdued or destructive. As with Amos 8, 11, a famine for hearing the words of truth, as with a social order in complete disarray, falling into dangerous, chaotic condition. That's where we are, beloved. And God is saying, I'm building you. I brought you to this moment and hour in history so that you could not only survive it, but you will be successful in it. You will be as a rock and a pillar in the midst of it so that other people can come to you for answers, for hope, encouragement, and healing. So what does all this mean for the right now, beloved, the today? What instruction can we derive from this unique hour of ours? These unprecedented times. I, I, could, I could do a tally sheet on the times I hear on the news. Unprecedented. Never happened before. Unpre you know, I've said this before, but it keeps coming. It keeps coming. Everything seems to be new, foreign, unfamiliar, uncertain, unpredictable, unknown. What? What? I mean, you know, would people just walk in around. What? What was that I heard? What was that I just saw in the news? Well, what? So it's okay to be anxious to some extent because, and God understands because he knows, as he said in Psalms 103, 14, he knows we're but dust. He knows what we're made of. He understands. And we take that, uh, those feelings of lostness and uncertainty, we go to him 10 times a day if we need to. So there's a new normal, another catchphrase that you see and hear all over the culture. As we learn on the fly, this new COVID-19 world of ours, and it's all new. Every I, I, I another phrase that tumbles out of me all day long. Everything's different now, Lord. Everything's different now. And I don't know if this is from the Lord, the second part. I don't think it'll ever be normal again, as we define normal. I don't think we're ever going to roll back to something that, the way it used to be. I don't think so. That's just me. I just don't think so. We're moving forward into something so foreign, so new, for, so forbidding, yet so wondrous. If you look on the other side of it, from the scripture's point of view, I don't think God has any intention of taking us back. Forward is where we're going. Is that phrase that also another cliche in society, I will never hear, moving forward. But it's true. We are. So consider all this a reality check that follows for what we're dealing with in this COVID-19 COVID COVID world of ours. It's, taken for, it's just an anecdotal piece I got from Israel Times, Emily Kirschenbaum, a very personal kind of struggling with it all. I think representative of all of us, Christian, Jew, Muslim, it, it's similar. To, this is the same thing we all feel. So bear with me. Uh, number one, a real thing. Now, this is... This has become a political statement, but it really is a, a, just a reality statement. Here's what she says. First, a real thing. This is an actual real disease. I don't care what you say otherwise. I can think, I can read, I can pray, I can listen, I can learn, I can assess, I can evaluate, and I'm telling you, nearly 200,000 Americans dead, 5 million infected, yeah, it's a thing. Dear God, tell Q to get off at the next stop if you even dare to ride with him down the track. Dear Lord, wake up. Shake off the nonsense. It's a thing. And no one knows enough about it to explain why some people have no symptoms, some people die. Thus, I again forcefully, forcefully dispense with the lunacy of a conspiracy-cooked illness or that one that doesn't exist. The dark consequence of which is more infection and more death. Hear me now. This is part of God's judgment. In my view, this is my view. And it will not yield to us until we yield to him who either sent it or allowed it to be sent. You can take that to the bank. Second, putting others first. She writes, 
there are people who really and truly just don't care enough about other people to be willing to do something as simple as occasionally putting on a mask when they go out. Oh, it's my loss of freedom. Oh, my dear Lord. And yeah, the government's going to use this thing to milk every cow in the barn and to corral them and, and use it for tyranny. I know that. I'm not stupid. And yet, and yet, reality shouts at me that by wearing the mask, it doesn't do anything for me. God's got me. I'm trying to protect others who may or may not be covered by the Lord. That's love. That's love. Putting others first. I don't know. Something I read in an old writing about 2,000 years ago in Mark 12, 31. Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know. Maybe I just made that up. You'll forgive the sarcasm. Or not. It's well placed. Next, sacrificial life. She writes, we already missed Passover with family, and we didn't have our annual summer trip to visit family. My dad is turning 75 next week, and, and we will have to celebrate via Zoom. These appear to be small sacrifices, beloved, but they are ripping apart a way of life we have, had. We have enjoyed all our life in America. And God's letting it be torn apart. Why do you think he's doing that? Let that hang in the air just a little bit. She goes on, For how long no one knows, my sense is that God is taking away many simple pleasures in the interest of living, of living oh, this is me, not her, living more simply now. Downsize is one of the words of the hour. Just get rid of the junk. No more time for hoarding. Just what's necessary. For the journey. And it is good for us, beloved, though it hurts our spoiled American soul. Next, impact on children. This is, here she writes pointedly, poignantly. My kids' loss of innocence is a way, in a way, is what I'm dealing with. I guess every generation experiences some sort of collective event that bursts the bubble of innocence. For me, it was 9-11. And I have quoted this before, beloved, from the late Joseph Sobrin, a uh, Catholic journalist and pro-life champion. He wrote this, and I finally found the quote just yesterday uh, from the Human Life Review, fall 1989. Listen to this. The long and the short of it is the exaltation of pleasure in society entails and demands the annihilation of the child. My point, the children always suffer the most in a crisis, in a war, in a plague, the kids. They're wondering, what is this, Mom? What is this, Dad? I don't understand. I'm scared. Children. Children. And for those who would deny that it's a thing and thereby indirectly contribute to the to the fear or the death of a child, Matthew 18, 6. What did Jesus say? If any of you cause even one of these young to stumble and to fall, better you find a millstone, tie it around your neck, find, find a high cliff and toss your sorry butt into the sea and drown. Don't tell me there are certain things that God dislikes, that, that he doesn't dislike. Please, don't mess with the children. Please, don't hurt them. Social life, socializing and energy rights and entertaining looks completely different now. We all know this, and that's okay. Gone are the days of three families coming over for a Shabbat dinner or lunch. No more massive quantities of food for everyone to share. And then I write, thus we either adapt or pretend that it's all a hoax. That's pretty much it. Those are the two camps. It's real or it's not real, you idiots. But, you know, I burned all my masks. I've got proof scriptures for each of these, but I got to move along. And so finally, she writes about a virtual world. Quote, Zoom is here to stay. I have mixed feelings about this one, but I have fully accepted it. And I am choosing, at least for the purposes of this blog post, to look at the positives. And then I attach this. So have we lost the invaluable gift of touch? That's a big deal. 
That's a big deal. Forced to replace it with distance learning, virtual business, online relationships, online dating, you know, more and more. Perhaps, just perhaps, to encourage each of us to turn heavenward, heavenward and to establish or perhaps reestablish divine relationship to the only one who can repair or fix any of it. And he could. He could if we would turn to him collectively and ask for forgiveness and ask him to make it right again. He's the only one, not the president. In sum, so it is, beloved, that we have entered a fierce and historic window careening us toward the eschaton. Look, I sort of said it with a with a smile last time. We're, we're in the era of Antichrist. We're in the era of the apocalypse. We're, we're, we're at the front edge of it. That's where we are. I guess in my long life, I never thought I would see it. Or even the beginning of it. But it's here. So, uh, all of this in our lives is designed for three great purposes, best I can determine it. One, to prepare humanity for the Lord's return. That's the big deal. That's the big, big, big deal that's coming. Two, to warn or punish the wicked and reprobate but giving them a final opportunity to repent. But the punishment's coming. It's already started. You can read about it in the news. Church. Three, to reward the faithful with a new song. To sing midst all this present darkness. Best explained in the words of the ancient Jewish prophet, and I quote, quoted it before, from Isaiah 60, one through three. Arise, from the depression and prostration in which circumstances have kept you. Rise to a new life! Exclamation point. Rise and shine. Be radiant with the glory of the Lord that will come upon you, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you! Exclamation point. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and dense deep darkness all the peoples, but the Lord promises to arise upon you, and, the, and his glory shall be seen on you, and nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. And yeah, I know, contextually and historically, that's a promise to Israel. But we are the grafted in inheritance from Israel. Christian and Jew, inseparable, but designed for a little bit of different experiences at the end of history. Which we'll probably get into more and more as we move down this road. I don't know why, it just came to mind. Denzel Washington, one of my heroes, and I don't have many. In the Book of Eli. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for everything I think we're experiencing. So we're to be lights of the dark in the darkness. I keep saying this could be our final hour, but the choice is ours. It's up to you and me. Do I want to be? used of God in this hour? Am I willing to pay the price for it and experience the suffering that goes along with it? Jesus even seemed to wonder about it in Luke 18, 7 and 8. And will not our just God, he wrote, he said, excuse me, uh, and defend and avenge his elect, his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night. Will he delay in providing justice on their behalf? I tell you that he will defend and avenge them quickly now. Quickly now, beloved. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find this kind of persistent faith on the earth? I mean, he already knows, but the rhetorical question is posed for us to consider. The teaching then, I got I to gotta finish up. Uh, from Psalm 96, about the new song. Let me go through these real quickly. First, a new song from the Hebrew Chadash, as I mentioned before, in another passage, something new or fresh, as with a new spirit, new king, new garments, new gates, new ways. Second, why? Why? One major, major reason in the second point. In order to declare God's glory, one of the phrases I love to use is boasting on God. If I do anything, if I ever fail in this, you let me know. I want to boast on him. He's like... I'm proud of him. I want to boast on him in a thousand different ways. 
depending on who it is I'm sharing with. Boast on him. Not preach to them. Boast on him. The things he's done in my life. The things he's done. To recount or relate from the Hebrew word safar, as with a scribe who writes and then proclaims. Keep a journal, by the way. Good idea. Proclaims the marvelous things in your life. As with Ezra, learn it in the law to inscribe or mark well, to make note of the things that he's done and that he does, to celebrate in the telling of it, to, you know, I, I, I'm i a pretty good storyteller and I go into the barbershops and I remember I, I went to uh, Floyd's barbershop a year ago or so looking for a new stylist, a barber, and I sat down and I'm in the chair with a little girl named uh, Kelly M who's now uh, had her first child. Anyway, we got, she's just precious as, as the day is long, we got to know her, and you know me, I start telling stories. All of a sudden, two or three of the other uh, stylists came along who are now among my best friends. Kelly M., uh, Christina Gray, uh, Amanda Waltman, Hannah Banana Bebow, they're all my close friends. You know why? Because I was telling stories. And about half of those stories were about boasting on the boss. They'd never heard that. I love them dearly. They're precious. Not one of them saved, but they're listening. So as is my practice, I like to highlight the two great ideas. To sing a new song, we have to go through some stuff and declare his glory to boast on the boss. I got to finish, got to finish. Commentary um, from Charles Ellicott. I, I derived two points. I'll skip over some stuff. I hear this, oh, a revival's coming. A revival in America is coming. A revival in the church. I don't believe it. Here's why. It's not contextualized. I believe God's in the business of revival right now, beloved. But not for the majority, because the majority don't want it. Who's being revived? There is a revival coming, though, not to the entire nation or even the church, but to the remnant who will not bend a knee to man nor beast nor Baal, but only to Yeshua ben David. That's where the revival is coming. That's where the new song is going to explode forth. Not in everybody, but that's what we hear taught. Oh, yeah, everybody's going to be great. No, they're not. Only the ones who want to be submitted to God to endure his plan for us in order to be made that new song, that new message, that fresh branch of a brand new tree for these times. It's glorious, but it's not for everybody. I've said this before, uh, Navy SEALs, and you'll get resistance from uh, the Green Beret or the Delta Force or, you know, the the rest of the special forces in, in our military, the Green Beret, uh, excuse me, the uh, Navy SEALs, I'm a Navy family guy, so forgive the bias, are often touted as being uh, the bravest of the brave, the toughest of the tough. Sorry, Army and Marine. and Trying to remember the dropout rate is something like 70 plus percent. Not everybody gets the glory, except those who are willing to do what God says to get there. It's the way it rolls. Sorry, that's the gospel as I see it. Not so much the gospel I've heard in church for 130,000 years. I know. And I quote from Revelation here. The point being, we are being prepared, beloved, in so many ways to sing our own victory song. I quote from Revelation uh, 5 and 14, for example, and now they, the four living creatures and 24 elders in heaven, sing a new song saying, Lord, you are worthy to open those seals. And I talk about again, that God is now opening those seals right now. I, it's not even a debatable point with me. And they also sang a new song before the throne of God and before the four living creatures and no one could learn to sing that song except the 144,000 Jews who had been ransomed and redeemed from the earth in order to be the witnesses during the Great Tribulation in chapter 7, following chapter 6. And now we are being taught 
a new song of victory for our hour, for our five-minute ministry, for our last mission. And it's all about chosenness, both Jew and Christian. In the Hebrew, chosen means is from the word bachir, bachir, or bachir. Don't know how to say it. Sorry, my Jewish friends. God's elect, those appointed to be excellent, acceptable, select, unique, chosen, designated by God to salvation, but also predestinated to glory at the end, to sanctification, usually with a plural, so to, to be set apart, to be more effective for the witness of boasting on God than others, because you belong to God, you're chosen. A lot of heavy theology there that I don't have time to go into. For Christians from the Greek, eklektos, select, by implication, favorite, chosen, elect, choice, select, sometimes uh, referring to those chosen out by God for the rendering of special service to him. Or of the Hebrew race, particularly Hebrews, the Messiah and the Christians, the preeminent given favor or preference. One of the most delicious words in the Christian language is favor, to be favored of God. Anything becomes possible when we're favored of him. So it's grace versus duty. I know I shall likely take some hits for dealing with this huge issue in so short a space. Which is election and free will. I got a bunch of complicated notes here, so I'm hesitating. My point is, underneath all this again, I'm so tired of the hyper grace thing. Oh, look, you just say yes to Jesus. You get it all. It's not the way it works. So I'm going to borrow from some Church of God uh, theology and some other what I consider to be sound rendering of the balanced recon reconciliation of the doctrines of free will and election. I dare to do it because I was led to try. But you're going to have to wait for it. I, can't, I don't have time to do it now. You have to wait till next time. <laughs> to use an old namesake. I've created for you a cliffhanger to entice you shamelessly into the second and final installment of our study. But let me give you a taste of what doctrine underlies where we go next. I'm going to end with this, a quotation from Psalm 1, 1 through 5, the first book in the psalmist's uh, text. My point being, you have to buy in, beloved, all the way. You've heard me say that for months now. There has to be a buy-in, a total, major, yeah, let's do this thing. Buy-in. Here's what the psalmist wrote. Now I'll close on this. Just about enough time to finish. Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and just rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. But his delight, hear me now, his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord. I've said it over and over again. The best way to show God how much you love him is to fiercely love his ideas, his truth. But his delight and desire in the law of the Lord and on his law, sometimes I hold the book to my chest, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders, studies, argues about, reflects upon day and night. And he shall be like a tree, firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity, the true prosperity doctrine. Now listen to the other part. But not so the wicked. Those disobedient and living without God and not so, are not so. But they are like the chaff 
worthless dead without substance, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked, that is those disobedient and living without God, shall not stand justified in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God. The sifting continues. And the choice is always ours to make. Which group do you want to belong to? No in-between. No in-between. No double-mindedness. No hesitation between right and wrong, yes and no. All in or all out. That's the way the book reads. So think about these things for next time, beloved. I love you very much. Uh, I hope these things are encouraging to you. They come through a very, very, very imperfect man. Uh, but I love trying. Uh, let's pray. Father, I thank you and bless you. There's a scripture that I didn't read. I skipped over. It's one of the most beautiful passages I've ever read. I think it's from Second Samuel somewhere. And I said it with tears just the other day. When I look around me and and the blessings that I enjoy, even in the midst of loss. How is it, O oh Lord, that you would be mindful of me and bring me to this place? How is that, Lord? And uh, let us all reflect on how you would choose the likes of us to use us to bring hope and life and light and love, healing and deliverance and even salvation to those who desperately need it, but just don't know where to look. We ask you to make us instruments of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. 57 minutes right on the dot. See you next time.